All right, so welcome everyone. Um, this is our first guest speaker event of the year. We've got Sam with us tonight, who's uh, an ecologist, PhD from Aberdeen, and a master's from Imperial, where he's uh, collaborating with the Psychedelic Research Centre. Sam's interested in the overlap between psychedelics and uh, another the natural world, which was so rapidly degrading. Sam's going to talk for about 30 to 40 minutes, and then we'll have a Q&A. Uh, so if you have any questions at any point, um, just put them in the in the chat function and then we'll go through them at the end and hopefully get through all of them. We are recording this talk and hoping to put it on YouTube, um, so just bear that in mind as well. So Sam, if you're, if you're ready with your presentation now, then we're ready I, to go. Cool, okay. Uh, just um, move this thing out of the way. Uh, okay. Can you see and hear me okay? Cool. Yeah. Um, so, um, yeah, here we go then. So, yeah, as Casper mentioned, my, my background's sort of ecology, entomology, and more recently I've kind of um, gone into a, a psychedelic research and I mean I'm interested in the potential of psychedelics uh, to enhance our connectedness to and the implications of that. So just to get the ball rolling I think it's important what I mean when I say nature connectedness. Um, so this is something quite specific and it is a measure of one's self-identification with nature. So the degree to which you see yourself as part of the natural world. And so this is something separate from just nature contact. And spending time with them. Um, they, they have links. So the great time in nature tends to uh, deeply devalue time with people and, and experiences in nature. So yeah, they, and these, these two things combined have formidably powerful benefits for mental health and well-being. So, nature connectedness itself is associated with um, psychological well-being in a variety of different measures. Sam, so you're just Sam, your your audio is like crackling a bit. Um, is it? Um, do you want me? Oh, what was that? That wasn't cool. Um, what do you suggest? Can is it still a bit crackly? It, it's fine now. It's just it's the, fine now. It just dropped quite a lot, and then. Do you want me? Um, shit, I've got. I have got some head. Do you want me to try headphones? Um, potentially. Which I don't have on my person, but I do have in this house. We, we could give it another go, and then if it um, if it happens okay. again. If it, yeah, this, I don't know how highly polished this is going to be for YouTube um, uploading, but we'll, uh, we'll, we'll see, we see about that when we get to the end point. of it. Um, yeah. Might need a bit of editing. Um, <laughs> like, okay, so yeah, nature connectedness, it's strongly associated with various psychological well being measures. So things like vitality, life satisfaction, life meaning, a sense of worthwhileness. Um, and, and decreased anxiety. It's also a mediator of some of the benefits one obtains from actually spending time in nature. So things like um, the ability to reflect on a life problem, uh, attentional capacity, um, and yeah, also life satisfaction following time in nature. Uh, it predicts or inspiring experiences, transcendent experiences following time in nature. And people who rate high in nature connectedness following contact with nature tend to place more value on intrinsic rather than extrinsic aspirations in life. So intrinsic aspirations covers things like um, self-growth, um, community, uh, stuff like that, whereas extrinsic is things like fame, money, social status. Um, so, yeah, it should also be noted that there was a, yeah, there was a study um, published earlier this year, 
and it looked at the effects of having access to nature, so nearby green space, use of those green spaces, things like nature documentaries, like David Attenborough nature documentaries, and also people's levels of nature connectedness. And it also looked at socioeconomic status. And what this study found was that nature connectedness far exceeded all the other factors looked at in this study. And it was four times more strongly associated with well-being than people's socioeconomic status, than their, yeah, their spending power, basically, which is like really interesting and compelling. So, yeah, in terms of psychedelics and uh, nature relatedness, which is kind of a never word for nature connectedness, um, denoting that the measures used. Um, so there's been some retrospective studies, so studies looking back in time at psychedelic users, and they found this strong effect of lifetime usage of classical psychedelics and people's sort of baseline nature relatedness scores. Um, and in particular, uh, we know from a few different studies. So a one study um, conducted by Robin Carhart Harris, who heads the Imperial Group, he took a subsample of major depression patients from the psilocybin trials at Imperial, and he looked at their, uh, among other things, their nature relatedness scores. And he did a long-term follow-up, uh, like a year later, and found that, yeah, that again, there was this um, marked increase in people's nature relatedness but importantly it persisted um, a year after the psilocybin session and that's also sort of echoed in more research so there's another study that was kind of grouping together eight separate different studies and uh, where psilocybin was administered to healthy volunteers and among other effects it found a third of those people um, experienced long-term positive changes to their um, relationship with nature and the environment and like there's a really crucial interesting I think point here um, in the latter two studies I just mentioned the psilocybin was administered in uh, clinical settings with no nature really um, and this to me is fascinating like I came across a study um, like a week or so ago and this was like a long-term nature immersion practice so basically people in this study got out into nature for half an hour for, for 30 days and they found at the end of this study as you might expect people's well-being sport scores went up their mindfulness scores went up um, but interestingly there was no change in people's nature connectedness so this isn't an easy trait necessarily to change or increase it's quite fixed like like personality types in, in a sense so the fact that a, you can give someone one of these, like a drug, a, psychedel a psychedelic substance in a setting lacking in nature, and it causes this enduring shift in how they relate to nature. That is something very interesting and very mysterious and not, yeah. as far as I know, reported in the rest of the literature uh, on nature connectedness. So that's something really special. One of my colleagues, uh, Chris Timmerman, who's a DMT neuroscience imperial, he brought this term to my attention, biodelic, that psychedelics are biodelic. They are, if psychedelic means soul or mind manifesting, biodelic means life manifesting. So part of how they might be doing this is they are um, making consciously available the inner contents of our living brain, our living system. So we're kind of like, we're connecting to our inner life because of course we are nature. This is, um, this is some cutting edge kind of research coming out of Imperial that's not been actually published yet, um, but it's, it was called the Insight Study and psilocybin was, was given to healthy psychedelic naive volunteers, so people who no prior experience with psychedelics, to look at the long-term brain effects by MRI and also psychological effects. And you can see here, if you look on the right here, um, connectedness to nature, um, shows this nice robust increase and then what's quite funky about that is that the three month follow-up later it's even higher than the initial sort of like yeah two and four week follow-ups so and what's interesting about this is it's happening this increase in connectedness nature uh, to nature is it's happening via an independent pathway to some of the other psychological benefits 
that psychedelics can yield. In this case, psychological insight conferred by the psychedelic session was a big predictor of, um, of well-being. But this connected to nature, to nature seems to be happening via a kind of independent pathway. And so that suggests it could be manipulated or enhanced in a supplementary fashion. Um, so a key mechanism here, um, sort of that's tied to the psychedelics being able to do this is their ability to induce ego dissolution. Um, and so this is under a big dose of a psychedelic, um, your default mode network, which is thought to be a kind of fundamental component of our, our ego or subjective sense of self identity kind of begins to sort of relax and then dissolve. And part of the ego's job uh, that the brain kind of concocts is to make us feel like we're separate from everything else around us. So we can like do our, go about our, our lives, our evolutionary lives. Um, but it's, yeah, so, but this, when the, when the default mode network is sort of like powered down by, by the psilocybin or the psychedelic, it can kind of facilitate this blurring of boundaries between self and other or self and nature. And this can be a really powerful experience that um, the memory of which can really stay with people. And it seems to be that this, this experience that psychedelics can occasion is, is an important part of the story here. And yeah, there was a study published earlier this year um, by a team in Finland, and they, they looked at people's like, a retrospective study looking back in time, um, but at people's first psychedelic experiences and the mystical ex type experiences, the peak experiences that can be associated with these. And interestingly, like one, of the, one of the most common long-term after effects of people having a psychedelic mystical experience in this population was a deepened, um, positively deepened relationship with nature uh, of, all the, of all the things. And, and this is interesting because we know that the mystical experience is one of the key predictors or mediators of the long-term benefits of, of psychedelics. And we also know that nature-based settings are, are kind of prone, perhaps more prone to eliciting these kind of mystical or transcendent experiences, even from sober consciousness. Psilocybin has been shown in a few different studies now to increase measures of, tra of personality trait openness. So this is one of the big five measures of personality. And psilocybin is able to sort of, um, yeah, increase it. And that's interesting as openness is associated with a few different cognitive abilities that other personality measures aren't, but it's one of the primary personality um, so measures, traits, sorry, associated with nature connectedness and also pro-environmental behavior. Uh, psilocybin has also been found, so ayahuasca has been found to um, lower neuroticism and psilocybin, I think. And that's interesting because people who rate high in neuroticism tend to get less benefit from nature contact. So if you're able to bring this down, that has um, really, yeah, important implications actually beyond, beyond just that. Uh, so ayahuasca users have been found to rate more highly in this trait, self-transcendence. So this is similar, actually, in some respects to openness. It's highly related to openness. And it's feelings of transcending the individual self to a much more kind of broader horizon. And that can in, sort of incorporate spiritual views as, as well. And this is important because it's, again, a significantly positive predictor of uh, nature connectedness and pro-environmental concern. Another interesting property that psychedelics have is that they can increase mindfulness-related capacities. And this can occur and does occur outside of a mindfulness meditation context as well. And this is interesting as nature connection, uh, connectedness and mindfulness are strongly linked. Uh, they have, seem to have a reciprocal, positively reinforcing relationship. So if you increase one, you tend to be um, increasing the other. Uh, Nature-based settings are, have, have this inherent capacity to kind of bring us in to a sort of more mindful, uh, present fo moment focused state. So this is some of my research that I was involved in at Imperial. 
and we did this pre uh, prospective survey study so we we looked at people before they took a psychedelic and then looked at them at two and four weeks and then we did a two-year follow-up so a lot long-term sort of snapshot uh, at, at where people kind of were and um yeah we sort of we found a few interesting things so firstly we found this very very strong relationship of past lifetime use of psychedelics and people's nature relatedness on the x-axis there at baseline so psychedelic use the past extent of psychedelic use very much predicted people's uh, nature relatedness or affected their nature relatedness to a marked degree but we also found in psychedelic naive people who'd never taken a psychedelic before there was also an increase in their in their nature um, and yeah from that study it was uh, we we found that access to natural environments or rather the perceived what people felt as self-reported uh the perceived importance of natural environments uh, for the acute psychedelic experience and also ego dissolution experiences they were two positive predictors of nature relatedness um, increase and yeah here's a, there's a few accounts here um from the from the from the stuff some of the research at imperial and this kind of indicates how this kind of might be experienced before i enjoyed nature now i feel part of it before i was looking at it as a thing like tv or a painting you're part of it there's no separation or distinction you are it i felt like sunshine twinkling through leaves i was nature so yeah my one of my sort of interest is yeah the, the sort of overlap between nature contact and, and how psychedelics seem to work and there's a number of intriguing neurobiological and psychological mechanisms that sort of overlap between them so firstly um, spending time in nature can increase sort of functional connectivity of the brain and uh, reduce rumination and this is something associated in both cases with psilocybin um, on a psychological ne level uh, simple acknowledgement of nature increases connectedness and not just to nature but in a broad in a broad sense and we know from the research on psilocybin that it too increases connectedness uh you know in a broad sense from self like to self to other people and to the world at large and nature um so yeah a never key mechanism underlying both of them um is awe the experience of awe. So nature is like a prototypical trigger of, of awe. Um, and, you know, that can be experienced by things like vistas or like, you know, great open scenes or like, um, and yeah, also interestingly fractals. So the experience like bird song and, and trees and like, yeah. And obviously fractal visionary stuff is very much a, a component of the, of the psychedelic state. Um, so I find this really interesting. There's there's some research coming out of Yale uh, where it's they they've taken military veterans with severe PTSD and they've taken them out into and had nature immersion experiences to help try and treat their PTSD, and they found that nature did really help these these people. But of all the things, the central uh, thing um, that seemed to be mediating this was awe. It was the experience of awe in nature. And we know awe increases things like psychological well-being and pro-social behavior towards others. People become sort of kinder to, to other people after the experience of awe. So it's associated with a number of important and interesting benefits. And I kind of like wonder about the potential of like having some kind of awe nature therapy in the future where you could com combine psychedelics and nature immersion experiences to sort of like saturate people with awe potentially and that could like impart uh, major healing perhaps so there's many different ways right that we can enhance the sort of overlap the synergy between nature contact connectedness and, and also psychedelics so we know from some research on psilocybin um, done by, conducted by Johns Hopkins that journaling in a spiritual context um, 
enhances markedly the long-term psychological benefits of psychedelics. And this has been seen from re other research is that psychedelics become all the more powerful when they're sort of um, act as amplifiers for a pre-existing practice rather than being just standalone things. And so yeah, one of the, the few interventions out there that's really been tried and tested for enhancing nature connectedness is the very simple act of recording um, in, a, in the form of a sentence things that you love or enjoy about nature and you just simply write a sentence of anything down that you encounter in your day-to-day -day. and once you start doing that um yeah it seems to result in this kind of fairly robust and sustained increase in nature connectedness so i'm thinking that would be a great thing to sort of potentially combine with psychedelic therapy uh, there's also the potential for doing things like shinrin yoku or japanese forest bathing which is effectively like an active mindfulness practice that takes place in woodland settings where you slow down and you chew into your other tune into your other senses and sort of like get out of yourself and that would likely synergize quite well particularly afterwards um, we know that um, there's a recent intervention that's been studied or walks the very like simple um, act of going for a walk seeking out things on it that will evoke a sense of wonder and awe um, 15 minutes uh, one weekly 15 minutes or walk over eight weeks uh, time frame in the study that they, they looked at increased uh, people's psychological well-being and their pro-social orientation and decreased mental distress very very simple intervention which had a really quite powerful effects uh, we know that the residual uh, feelings of awe can linger, persist after a psychedelic session. So something like this would be really good because it would kind of tap into that potentially. Um, at the same time, we know that increased, that increased acknowledgement of nature enhances connectedness and connectedness too also persists beyond the psychedelic session. So by, by going on nature-based awe walks, you can kind of uh, kill two birds with one stone in that you can kind of tap into the persisting awe and connectedness, but for greater psychological benefit. There's also the, the possibility of incorporating some horticultural exercises. So horticultural therapy is kind of gaining more, more traction, uh, you know, getting people out to sort of a, a garden, gardening type uh, environment and context. And so things like tending the soil before a psychedelic session and then maybe planting a seed that you then sort of take away and nurture. So, you know, part of psychedelic therapy is the integration work where you have insights that pertain to you and your personal life and the challenge going ahead is how to integrate those and sort of nurture those insights into your life so if you've got like this like baby tree or, or seed that you're hatching into a plant at the same time it's a kind of nice analogy um, for that also um the psychedelic clinics of the future so right now given the very strict laws there's no way you could take legally take people out tripping into the into nature in the uk just no way um so if we can't take nature people out into nature um potentially like maybe we can bring nature into the clinic because right now you know having set up a treatment room at, at imperial college which is really nice you know we've got some salt lamps in there like nice screens with woodland uh, scenes and stuff you know we turn this room that was designed for immunocompromised patients so this, as sterile as sterile you can get to sub to quite a nice chilled earthy pad but like being able to like bring in plants and, and other organic like life living things uh would be quite nice i also think you know let like in the future hopefully psychedelic clinics or centers they'll be in beautiful uh situated in beautiful natural settings so somewhere like woodland and you could build them so there were windows and the skylights and you could kind of titrate the amount of nature people kind of receive um, based on their wishes and needs so the great thing about that is um, obviously like taking people outdoor like outdoor therapy sort of has its have some benefits but it also has some drawbacks like it's less secure it's less safe it's less controlled and predictable Whereas the, the inside of a center or clinic has those advantages of, of security and um, yeah, controllability. Whereas, yeah, if you build the actual clinic in a natural setting, then potentially you've got the best of both worlds. Um, so yeah, we've got 
kind of a growing mental health crisis and a growing uh, environmental crisis. And while the causes of them aren't, aren't the same, um, it's, I think, disconnection. A grow, like a, a growing dis, dis, disconnection kind of lies at the root of both of them. A disconnection from nature, I think, is fueling our the environmental crisis and sort of a disconnection in a broad sense is fueling the mental health crisis. So yeah, sort of going on from what I was saying before about nature connecting this kind of um, predicting people's value that they place on nature and their time spent in it. Um, nature contact at this time is a hugely underutilized health promoting resource. So the potential of interventions that can increase people's contact with nature um, yeah, it's definitely worthy of uh, investigation. And yeah, it's also interesting to note that nature connectedness is a strong, if not the single strongest predictor of pro-environmental behavior. And this is an interesting finding given there's a lack of notable interventions for reversing humans' environmentally destructive behavior. And we find ourselves now in a sixth mass extinction event. Um, just to be clear, I do not think psychedelics are a panacea or a magic bullet. They're not enough to save us from ourselves. Um, and they're not going to do the hard work of regenerating the increasingly degraded biosphere. But what they can potentially do um, is act as catalysts of connection. We know from the research that psychedelics increase synaptic dendritic connections um, coming off individual neurons. They increase global brain connectivity. They link up usually separate and distinct areas of the brain. They connect us to our core cells. They connect us to other people. They connect us to nature and the universe at large. So if used with care and if used well, um, psychedelics could act as, as catalysts uh, of connection, which I think um, yeah, is, is, could be really important at this time we find ourselves in. Thanks. And sorry about the, the light that I've just noticed re like really bright behind me. That wasn't good placement of, of laptop. So yeah, apologies for that. <laughs> Thanks very much, Sam. Um, I've got a question to start with, which is cool. how, do you actually, how do you actually measure nature connectedness? Good question. Yeah, no, I should, I should really like include this, I think, in the presentations. Um, so there's, so essentially, with something like nature connectedness relations, the only way you can really assess it is to sort of ask people questions. And then you sort of rate them on a sliding scale, like a Linkert scale of one to five. So the scale we use that's been quite widely tested and validated and is quite a solid, if short measure, is called the NR6, the nature relatedness six measure. And it's a six item scale and there's two, uh, two items in each sort of subgroup, and they simply ask you in different ways about your relationship to, to nature. And, and then you simply answer, and then it kind of gives a, a, an added up mean from that. So it might sound um, pretty crude, but we're not gonna like get, get, really get this, I don't think, from brain scanning and, and doing that, like certainly not alone. And just to kind of get across, like some people, um, would take the view that like this essentially qualitative research is like, yeah, it's, it's, not, it's not particularly revealing or powerful, but it very much can be. So my colleague, uh, Dr. Ros Watts, who sort of led the uh, psilocybin major depression um, studies, she, um, she, it, was, it was from her qualitative research of actually speaking to people that she found this link between depression and disconnection. And that psilocybin worked in part by, by facilitating increased feelings of connectedness. And yeah, no amount of sort of brain scanning would have really would have picked that up. So yeah, I do think there's there's like, I think it's really important this this qualitative stuff. Um, it has its it has its place. So yeah, that's it really. You simply have to ask people um, certain questions and then sort of get their get their feedback. And when you talk about pro environmental behavior as well, how, again, how do you measure that and what does that actually entail and how much of a difference does that make 
and can well, that Well, that's them? it's a good it's a it's a good question. So, I mean, we've we've not I've not personally, as part of my research, looked at pro environmental behaviours. Like, there's a lot of there's a lot of studies to show that there's a strong link between nature connectedness and pro environmental behaviours. Um, there's there's a paper. Um, uh, yeah, an interesting paper published a few years ago, Matthias Forsman paper, 2017, uh, something like um, lifetime experience with classical psychedelics predicts an increase in pro-environmental behavior uh, through increasing nature relatedness or something along those lines. And so he was looking at the link between psychedelic nature relatedness and pro-environmental behavior. So he, he kind of like incorporated some pro-environmental um, behavior questions into that which which he from his analysis he found a link there are it's a very sort of cutting edge and rapidly growing area so there are it's come to light to me recently that there's been a few pro conservation and pro environmental kind of um, qualitative measures assessed so this is where like questions um, are formulated and then they're like given out to you know to conservationists who actually work in the field to, to validate to make sure that the questions are actually valid conservation behaviors so you obviously you need to speak to people actually working in the field so it's kind of a work in in progress but i'm hoping like if i do more research within in this area then i'll definitely be wanting to incorporate more like environmental behavior measures and, and lifestyle measures things like consumerism materialism seem to sort of be linked to this so it'd be interesting to look at things like that too okay that all sounds really good um people who've joined late do put questions in the chat and then i'll i'll come oh, to yeah, you so gregory, gregory has a question if you want to unmute unmute yourself um and ask it otherwise i can read it out Hello. Okay, so Gregory says, when talking psychedelics, are we just talking mushrooms? If so, Hello, yes. are... sorry, sorry, you go for it. Hi. Yes, um... hi, hi. Sorry, I joined you late. Um, thank you. It was really interesting. Yes, I was. I was just wondering, just when we're talking mushrooms, is it just when you're talking psychedelics? Is it just mushrooms we're talking about, or? Um, so yeah i mean so a, a, a fair chunk of this presentation actually has been discussing psilocybin research but all, it was kind of a bit of a split actually but no so classical psychedelics i guess are like your good old-fashioned psychedelics so yeah. things like like psilocybin dmt ayahuasca lsd mescaline all those right. the old the oldies but goldie kind of classics of the 60s kind of heyday rather than these like all the new kids on the yes. block, like the 25 eyes and the two C's. I get it. And, 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 my, and, uh, into it actually. my question was, how yeah. is it helping um, people with depression and those sort of, um, apologies if you covered it, depression and, you know, how is it maybe helping people in that sense? Um, yeah. And, 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 as a, as a, and, and as a bit of a joke, um, when I was very young, I remember psilocybin mushrooms and and when picking them you picked one and and if you if you ate it and you walked along they would be they would turn luminous and they would seem to show themselves mm. but uh, only them not the others which was very interesting because when I saw uh, some young people who had plastic bags and they were picking um, because from my early age, my dad was a mushroom picker and I knew about mushrooms and I helped the young people try and sort out which was which were right to eat and which were, were poisonous. Um, they didn't know what they were doing. But I just mm. thought from, from, from digesting them and seeing them luminous when it was just them that illuminated. So it was a bit of odd, really. But Well, um, that's very interesting. I've, I think I've, I've heard of similar, similar tales. I think my, when I heard it from a friend, I think he did say all mushrooms were really standing out, though, rather than just the Liberty, the liberty Caps in particular. But no, interesting, tuning into the, um, yeah, that level of awareness. Certainly, yeah, it's going to ramp up your senses and sort of get you, get you more in the moment. So I can see and, how... And being like, outside, absolutely, being outside in nature, I always remember when I, I went camping and um, I went camping and we just went camping and we actually camped on Ministry of Defence land. <laughs> and we didn't nice. see the sign. We didn't see the sign. But then we were woken up in our tent with someone with um, 
outstations and it was obviously police or some something something's very very um, formal um, yeah and you know it sort of scared us but we didn't realize um, but you know being outside in nature there's such a connectiveness um, camping mm. mushrooms and just appreciating the outdoors um, yeah I know you said there might not necessarily be a link but I think that um, that certainly what you're saying it all rings true and chimes with the catalyst for the brain and actually understanding um, you mentioned about connection to the universe well-being so um, fascinating that it's now gone into a sort of academic study really because um, mm. I feel very much I fell into the cauldron like Obelix um, very young um, yeah following, following following it I was just thinking when are the scientists going to pick up on it so yeah. I'm oh no, science, science, the scientists are definitely, there's, there's a lot of, um, I saw a graph today and it was like the amount of scientific papers that have been published just this year. And it's far, far more than anything that was published in the sixties, like at the peak of the, the research, the original research in the fifties, sixties. So science um, and the researchers doing it are very much, Kind of ca catching up i mean it's bloody hard because these things are very very illegal and it's extremely challenging to and often very expensive to be able to do this research it doesn't it's, it's not easy um that's why we did a survey study because just like the concept of like dosing people with psilocybin and you know like having getting people outside into nature like it's totally inconceivable to do that in the uk you might have you read the castaneda book sorry the, Have you read the, the, the you know, the um, um, Castaneda books? I've read, the, I read and enjoyed the first one. Yeah, I've not read read any of the others. Yeah, the first but, um, one was the best one, absolutely. Yeah, no, I did enjoy that. But what you're saying before about depression, so yeah, there's a, there's um, I know some of the people involved in this. So there's a few things going on that are important, uh, particularly so focusing on on psilocybin. Um, Firstly, psilocybin, um, it, as mentioned earlier, you might have missed actually, uh, it increases feelings of psychological connectedness in a broad sense. So connectedness to self, connectedness to others, connectedness to the world at large, including nature. And this is really important because we know from the research that a state of psychological disconnection is associated with a range of different um, mental health issues, including severe depression. And so as you move towards a state of greater connectedness, um, it seems to sort of, it's a strong predictor of uh, associated with recovery of mental health and associated with good mental health. So connectedness, yeah, is, is an important part of the story. Um, another thing that psilocybin does, it's, it increases acceptance of unpleasant emotions and, in, and decreases experiential avoidance. So this is something that happens in terms of, it's quite the common part of depression where you, um, if there's something really negative, if you've had a trauma in your past, you, you won't, yeah, kind of partly triggered by that experience. You won't want to like, you'll push away bad feelings because you might have experienced something so bad once that you just, you have a, like an immediate revulsion to like taking on any bad feelings, but you know, it's normal to like take on to, to experience bad feelings and the psilocybin kind of opens you up in a way that you kind of accept, accept and make peace with bad feelings. And that's an important part of sort of being able to kind of, yeah, recover from, um, from depression is not. Absolutely. To push I, I always remember a friend of mine who always, when when he experienced that he said it was like uh, the skeletons in his cupboard he it sort of he faced reality in terms of that and it sort of brought peace in terms of facing that with him which was i yeah. thought yeah just what you're saying yeah. uh, sounds, sounds sounds really great um thanks for your response there sam we've got a couple of other questions so matt if you want to jump in yeah. Uh, hi, Sam. Uh, thanks for the great talk. We had a question about the uh, the nature connectedness part. So you sure. saying um, you were saying that there's possible uh, personality trait changes, like in things like openness, resulting from an increase in nature connectedness. 
uh, are we talking about like permanent changes in, in, in personality here or is it a short term thing or? Um, so yeah, so that's a good question. So firstly, yeah, the link, so the, the increase in openness and the increase in nature connectedness, like they, you know, there could well be a link between them but they're not directly linked so yeah. it's kind of yeah the more open you are the more kind of connected to nature you also tend to be but it's not like you increase like nature connectedness and then you will automatically increase openness so they're both they're both fixed traits and not that easy to shift but at least with psilocybin we know that it's the mystical type experiences the peak experiences people have that increase openness. Um, if people don't have that experience, then it doesn't tend to shift people's personality. Uh, same with ayahuasca. We know that people who have mystical experiences of ayahuasca become significantly less neurotic. So you need these big transformative peak experiences to be able to shift personality. It's not an easy thing to do. Um, so, um, what was I gonna say? Uh, personality traits shifting um, so ah yeah so so I mean it was generally thought like I think it was like in the 80s 90s it was thought basically by the age of 25 your personality was essentially fixed and you weren't likely to shift it maybe therapy maybe years of therapy could kind of shift it a bit maybe uh, but we now know that it's not it's not fixed like that like certain experiences like near-death experiences are a good example um they i would kind of argue that they're sort of maybe on a, they're on a more powerful level than uh psychedelics experientially and in terms of how they change people but they can kind of affect radical change to personality very rapidly um and psychedelics can but to a lesser capacity uh so yeah, this change in nature connectedness, in openness, uh, the, it does seem to be a long-term thing. Like I think in the ayahuasca and neuroticism thing, they did a six month study um, follow up and it was still high there. Um, our study found like up to two years later, people were still very much sort of connected. Um, so yeah, the original Hopkins, Johns Hopkins paper on psilocybin and mystical experience, which is what ignited the whole modern um, psychedelic research renaissance which was published in 2006 um, that found yeah at 14 months later 14 months post psilocybin people's openness was still high so it does seem to be it does really seem to persist if anything you know it's interesting being able to change openness particularly as we age if anything openness starts to kind of come down a little bit as we get older so and neuroticism, like high neuroticism is associated with so many neg like negative health things. So it's, a, it's an important predictor or precursor to Alzheimer's and neurodegenerative diseases. So the ability to like increase your openness while decreasing your neuroticism is, is quite amazing. And like, um, yeah, that's kind of a cutting edge frontier that's not really being explored yet. Like the implications, the health implications of personality change with psychedelics is, is big, interesting stuff, I think. Cool. So um, Martin has put something in the chat, which I'll read out because I think it's important to consider other viewpoints and sure. try, and, try and sort of have a conversation. He says, you don't need psychedelics to gain from benefiting from nature. You just have to go for a walk in the countryside. You have said nothing about the dangers of psychedelics. You may be encouraging impressionable students to try them out. Very bad idea. So what do you say in response to that? Um, well, yeah, I've already kind of made clear, I thought, the difference between nature connectedness and actually spending time in nature. Um, so yes, going for a walk in nature um, is good for you. I heartily recommend everyone makes time for walking in nature. Um, but walking in nature alone uh, doesn't, won't necessarily change your, your connectedness to nature uh, in any way. Like as mentioned, that study where people were encouraged to spend half an hour for 30 days in nature didn't affect anyone's uh, level of nature connectedness. Um, 
so so that's something to consider it's not an easy thing to to shift um and yet it's an important thing to shift potentially uh because it um, has big implications not only for our mental health our likelihood of spending time in nature but also for pro-environmental um, awareness um, I resent that I'm encouraging anyone to full-heartedly consume psychedelics um, like this research that I've been talking about I've been a part of is as I say a prospective uh, survey study on naturalistic use. The other studies I mentioned are like strictly controlled uh, clinical studies conducted by leading research departments at various universities. Um, and I've not done or said anything to encourage um, or condone reckless use of psychedelics. So I resent that statement. And as mentioned in my conclusion, I was only uh, I was only recommending psychedelics can be used in a safe and controlled way. As I was emphasizing, you know, incorporating nature into the sessions, it should only be done in like a, stru a structured, let's say, um, context. So, yeah, that's what I would say to that. I would think that the people watching this, if they're at university, I think they're capable of making up their own mind. Um, you know, based on their own research. Thank you very much. So I think that was maybe a bit of a condescending thing to say, actually. Here, here. Um, Chris, you've got a question. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I, I thought your uh, your talk was really fascinating, Sam. And uh, I've um, I wanted to ask, where do you think you where do you think you see your research going next? um so that's well yeah it's an interesting question so i'm just about to have published um in an open access journal so it'll be all sort of accessible just a a big extensive review paper on all this sort of bringing together all the the science that's out there all the research that's been done to make the sort of scientific case for the incorporation of more nature content and settings into people's therapeutic psychedelic sessions and also looking at the overlapping mechanisms between nature contact and and psychedelics as well um, so and yeah that's sort of i wanted to kind of do that to sort of bring everything together and sort of like make the case you know while making obviously while also very much um not trying to challenge the, cl the clinical approach of like you know um, dosing people in like controlled environments to keep them safe and make sure everything's okay but just sort of saying that like there that we can do more with psychedelics than is currently being done with the clinical approach try and sort of make that case like there's room for other approaches here and like increasing nature connectedness is something that's definitely worthy of its own own attention rather than being a kind of like a little side interest which it is now um, and yeah, at this time, I'm working for the Synthesis Institute, which is a kind of legal psilocybin retreat in the Netherlands. And it's kind of a really well-run professional operation in that it uses proper therapists, uh, psychotherapists, it has medical screening. And um, my role there is to sort of assist in um, orchestrating individual, tailoring individual plans for people undergoing the now clinical arm of this so so people with depression can sort of um, join the retreats there and have like um, therapeutic support and they're putting on this year-long therapeutic sort of program which is great and i'm my role is to kind of um, get them doing nature-based activities so i sort of make a, a menu of different possibilities for like nature-based activities and practices and also service options so linking people up to volunteer organizations to get out and do stuff for nature and then people can kind of pick and mix their own individual plan from those options and, and i do the networking on their behalf and all of that stuff so that's my current role i don't think i'm able going to be able to research it unfortunately I actually learned today because of the whole conflict conflict of interest because i'm 
being employed by synthesis, it wouldn't be good scientific practice for me to be doing the research because like they're paying me. So, uh, you know, the theory would be like they, they're going to want to see good results, even though they, they wouldn't. So I think a colleague of mine, Dr. David Luke, who's based at Greenwich, he's going to independently um, do some research on these activities that people are doing. Fantastic. Thank you. Thanks, Chris. Lydia has a quick one, which is how will we find your paper, please? Great talk. Thanks. Um, how about I email it to you, Casper, or send send it to you when it's when it's live? Yeah, and then you can like, then you can like do a yeah, sh share it how how you see fit. Um, yeah, I'll um I'll email it round and I'll put it in the description for the YouTube video as well. Cool. Oh right, yeah. So there's the one I there's the public there's the paper. Uh, if you look up from egoism to ecoism, there's not much online called that. But TEDx talk, um, it will it will come up. So that's the study I was involved with in, at, at Imperial, and that's that's all open access, um, the full paper. So yeah, from egoism to ecoism. Okay, um, I guess it's my turn now. Uh, so you mentioned the best results are seen in combination with another practice. Um, could you tell me how the other practices were selected, please, and also give some examples of the ones implemented, please? So this is research that I wasn't personally involved with. So, but it's part, it comes out of Johns Hopkins by Roland Griffiths and his team. So Roland is like really well-respected psychopharmacologist, um, got interested in psychedelic research, and he's sort of, and the team there, they, they looked at, um, a few things. I think a, a course of like mindfulness meditation and also journaling with an emotive, in an emotive context. And I don't know the full, I tried to look up to find out more sort of about the journaling and I couldn't really sort of get that much kind of information. But I guess people were like journaling their day to day thoughts and emotions and stuff like that. And it's been shown that doing that is, is quite therapeutic unto itself. So I think people started these practices so a meditation or a journaling practice um like a month or two before their psilocybin session and there would have been the control group who, who didn't do that who just had the psilocybin session alone and they found that the people who've been journaling and meditating um definitely had increased um benefits psychological benefits from the people who didn't i think there's been research in switzerland too uh, a mindfulness meditation school there center and they also found that people like the regular meditators um obtain more there was a synergy between the meditation and the psilocybin experience and, and people the met the, the meditators reaped more benefits psychologically from the psilocybin experience um in the case of the nature connectedness study uh the the journaling practice there the, the, the practice was simply recording three things a day in it like in the form of a sentence that you love or enjoy about nature for five days and the control group uh in this study they simply um wrote down three facts about nature for five days and there was no change in their nature connectedness whereas the people writing emotive things that gave them joy that they loved they showed this this increase and then it was persistent two months after that intervention so so that's quite interesting because it's saying that the, this nature connectedness is it's happening on a kind of an emotional experiential domain rather than something kind of more uh, yeah analytical or, or yeah academic based i hope that's some way helpful yeah thank you very much so um we'll come to john in a second jill Oh, it went a bit glitchy then. A bit glitchy. Casper's frozen in time. <laughs> Me. I mean, I can take over the reading also committee if you want. <laughs> Might as well. Um, so Jill mentioned she works in horticulture and got into it because suffered for many years with depression and wanted to gain a reconnection, particularly with nature. I can relate to that because I also enjoy gardening myself. Yeah. Um, She's never used psychedelics before, though it's fascinating in how, in how they would affect her. 
anything to speak on for that? I don't know. So exactly sorry, can we like start at the very start beginning of what you just said there? So who's this sorry? Uh, so Jill Heckel uh, in chat says she works in horticulture and got into yeah. it because I have suffered for many years with depression and wanted to gain a reconnection, particularly with nature. I've never used psychedelics before, though I'm fascinated in how they would affect me. Um, so would you have anything to say on that? And also uh, for my, uh, well, something that's just come up in my head as well is you mentioned that the journaling practices were started before the, um, the psychedelics. Yes. Period. Yeah. Um, would you say that people that have these prior connections with nature would have more to gain with psychedelic um, experiences than people who are fresh to it? Or is it just like a, everyone starts at a baseline? That's, no, that's a good question. Um, so I'll just shoot for the, I'll just maybe shoot for the last one and then go back in time. Um, yeah, so I was part of this conference speaking in, in Holland and like one of my colleagues, I just mentioned David Luke. So David Luke is based at Greenwich and he's interested in psychedelics and nature connection. And he, he, he coined this term ecodelic, psychedelics are ecodelics. They kind of manifest eco kind of consciousness and yeah i think from his research he found that yeah people who already rated highly in nature connectedness um prior to taking uh psychedelics did maybe um experience ha have richer they, they got more out of it i think so now i think there is something there but like what interests me um about um the potential of psychedelics i've met a few people and this is only anecdotal at this stage so bear that in mind but i've met a few people who sort of come up to me and that they you know self-reportedly have said like you know i wasn't really a nature person before psychedelics i didn't really have that interest or that connection and it only took one psychedelic experience and like they turned on and tuned into nature in a big yeah, way and that seemed to sort of persist and stay with them and that's that's amazing that that that's the the, the real potential that I, I i see here it's like because you know we're increasingly urbanizing species like more and more of us are living are being brought up in environments that are lacking in nature and we know from the research that people's childhood contact with nature is a big predictor of later life connection and contact with nature so you know, so that's a shame. More and more people are, are being brought up without the opportunity of, of having regular nature contact. So, and here's a potential, I guess, you know, substance, organic technology, whatever label you want to apply, that can potentially sort of, yeah, in, in cut through that, cut through people's like prior childhood lack of connection maybe, and sort of radically um, and powerfully bring nature into focus in a big way. So that's, that's i think that's um that's really positive in terms of like yeah de de depression and uh, it sounds like um i've forgotten her name now sorry i'm not good with names but it sounds that like your horticultural practice sounds that sound and your gardening stuff that sounds really wholesome uh, i'm not i don't know if it's my um you know if it's my position to be recommending people for the psychedelics because i'm not a therapist i'm just a researcher um but it sounds like it's definitely it's definitely a worthy avenue um to explore i think and i do think you know in the next sort of five to ten years um psilocybin will be rescheduled and and recognized as a as a depression treatment in this country but our government is extremely uh, rigid and backward looking when it comes to the research the potential of these things like if you challenge the the home office you should not be in charge of dictating these laws they just give you this revoltingly idiotic um, copy and paste uh thing that it might as well crack might as well have been the thing they're talking about because they make the claim that there's no evidence these that all the evidence suggests these things are harmful and they ruin communities and there's no evidence on either of those fronts, you know, these classical psychedelics have been used for centuries. They're non-toxic. Yes, they're powerful. They need careful handling. That's why they need to be, you need to prepare people. You need to do it in a, in a therapeutic space and, and sort of screen people. Um, but um, yeah, there's, there's huge potential here for treating conditions that aren't 
at this point in time being treated very well and people are suffering and, and dying as a result of that. So it's a real shame that, that things are the way they are, but things are shifting and thawing. So it will get, these things will get more accessible in time. Um, there are legal psilocybin retreat options like synthesis and like Jamaica, there's other parts of the world where, you know, psilocybin uh, is legal. Of course, you know, psilocybin also grows for free in our, in our land. It's an indigenous psychedelic. But as it pertains to depression, we know from the research that's being done that the therapeutic context um, is, is really important. You know, psychedelics are non-specific psychic amplifiers. If that, that's a bite-sized thing of how they work. So if you prepare the ground, uh, you know, in terms of having some, some prior uh, preparation therapy, and then you've got the support during the experience, and then you've got importantly, particularly importantly, the follow-up integration work. It's probably the most important bit actually for maintaining the, the benefits. Because we know from the research that's been done that for people that studied the, the phase one study, so this was with people with severe treatment resistant depression who tried multiple different therapies and treatments, nothing had worked, and some of them were at their wits end. And psilocybin worked well uh, for the vast majority of these people. But not all of them, I don't think even most of them got lasting remission. You know, after about three months post psilocybin session, people's depression scores start to, to creep up again. And like one of my colleagues, Dr. Ros Watch, she thinks unlike say existential anxiety, so the fear of death uh, faced by terminally ill people with a cancer diagnosis, psilocybin, a single psilocybin session worked amazingly. But clinical depression, severe depression is something else. It's a, it's a more complex multifaceted disease. It's not just about the, the fear of the death and the ego. It's, so it's like, she feels that it, a course of psychedelic therapy is going more likely, you're gonna probably need several sessions in a therapeutic context to affect lasting change um so yeah we're still you know it's still early days the the research we're still testing out what works and how to maximize the benefits and then so but it's yeah it's very it's definitely an avenue worthy of, of looking into is what I'll, I'll say to play it safe thank you very much that was a really interesting answer um john you mentioned that you had a question uh, to ask so i'd like to pass the mic to you Hi, yeah, sorry, thank you, wonderful. Thank you very much, great. It's great to see this all being done. You know. um, Thanks, got a, John. I, I, also, like, I'm an old acid head, <laughs> so, uh, but I'm a sort of uh, academic odd job man, making a living. But the, the point that I wanted to say was that, on the one hand, uh, uh, mystical searching, mystical searching um, is a voyage into the unknown. It's a void, and, and the unknown, in, in, in a sense, is an essential part of it. So certainties, structures of knowing, um, uh, are, are not known. I mean, they're given up. I mean, that, that, yeah. that it's a voyage. But then a large bit of your language and a large bit of your sort of research uh, circumstances is infused by measurement. It's infused by... Uh, categories of measurement now, i can understand why that is the research milieu yeah narrative that we that we live in um uh, and that, i don't think we can avoid it i'm not trying to completely yeah. resist it but 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 the, but the, there is a real essential tension there is an attention the essential tension is between trying to measure things <laughs> often which are in unmeasurable <laughs> and and the, the the sort of healing of the human spirit which uh, takes us it takes a place in a, in a kind of mystical environment in which uh, measurement is just um to be honest sorry for my terms but bollocks it's just mm. It's not. It's not. It's not possible. It, it is. It's not part of the story. So on the one hand, you have a driver for um, measurement, and that, a, lot, a lot of your scientific credentials that you use with it. But I, I do. I don't. It's not, I'm not saying it's wrong, but there's a, you don't import this, but it's there. Is that there's a positivist kind of line within that measurement story, um, which which wants to account things as kind of itemized measurable stuff um, and then on the other hand there is uh, um, and the mystical sort of uh, aspiration for things that are not measurable so there's a, an essential kind of 
uh, oppositional tension between mm. the resolving of the human spirit and the, the attempt to capture it. It's a bit like Heraclitus trying to capture water. You know, it's a, it, 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 it runs through your fingers as you try and mm. do it. So as you're struggling away with your, your, your measurement indexes, which are, which are often very impressive, and as far as, as, as evidence goes, it's, it's great. But on the mm. other hand, Real healing doesn't work that way. At least I don't think it does. Well, yeah, but I guess you know. I mean, my, I mean, my, my, my thing of research is, you know, I'm not even. It's I'm not. It's not the healing I'm really trying to measure or, or assess. And I think like we're only potentially looking at indirect. Uh, and possibly slightly clunky barometers of people like is their psychology is their is how they feel moving in a direction that is beneficial to them and to what degree do, does that does that persist with people how can we maximize that process um, and how can we strengthen it so i think i think it's yeah, I, I see what you, you're saying, but I think like that's why I think like the connectedness is really interesting because connectedness is a central tenet of, of ecology, you know, of my background. Like ecology is the scientific study of the interconnection of living systems. Interconnection is also rife in the, medita in, in the meditation uh, and religious literature. You know, mystical, mystical experience is interconnection. You know, that's the, that's its primary thing is, is its interconnection and unity. So there is there is a sort of like there is an overlap between what can seem quite rigid scientific sort of constructs and our very most deep, immersive, mystical sort of type type experiences. And like psych and psychedelics are great because they're experiential tools, you know, they, they can lead to experiential knowledge rather than academic knowledge they're a different pathway to knowledge and when they're married together i feel like they can be be really powerful but i feel like we do need to take some measurements i mean the nature relatedness it's, it's a pretty chilled out laid back measure you know in terms of it's not particularly kind of invasive it doesn't take long to do i mean some people might consider it kind of a bit wishy-washy but there's no it's pretty hard to sort of you know, find these things out without simply talking to people. And I kind of like that. I think there's an organicness to these qualitative things because like, you know, you're asking people these carefully thought out questions and they're sort of answering how they best feel like they, they resonate with these things. And like, yeah, they're not perfect. They're clunky. Um, but in order to kind of like, in order to kind of like sell the healing potential of these things to certain scientific and medical quarters, and also just general public, we, we, need, we need these terms that are widely applicable and that can allow comparison between different people and different studies and, and things like that. So they're, they're not the be all and end all, but they do have an important part to play, I think. Yeah, I, I'm persuaded by your answer. That, that I don't know was, if that's sort of a... Yeah, no, it was. No, it, was my answer, it was a really good answer. Thank you very much, Sam. I really, really enjoyed that. And John, that was a great question as well. Um, I think we sadly have to end this here because we've gone slightly over the um, scheduled time. Uh, I wonder, uh, Sam, is there any uh, way that people could support your work? Um, socials, if they want to get in touch with you or anything, email, that kind of thing. Anything um, yeah, like, um, I mean, I'm on, I'm on Twitter, at Samwise Gandhi. Um, my email is greensam, all lowercase, 2512, <laughs> at hotmail.com. Um, so, yeah, if you want to, yeah, want to get in touch, please, please drop me, drop me a line. Much. I know that I really enjoyed it, as did the rest of the committee. And uh, thank you for such a great turnout from everyone as well. We hope you enjoyed it just as much as we did. Yeah, no, it was it was fun and some good good questions uh, and stuff as well. Yeah, nice one. Thanks for having me and stuff. Um, yeah.
take care, everyone. Brilliant. Thanks so much, Sam. Bye-bye. Stay safe with lockdown, everyone. I'll hopefully see you soon. <laughs>